All right. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for tuning in. So as Sergi mentioned, my name's uh, my name's Lester. Uh, I work at Verizon Media Group, uh, previously uh, Yahoo, and as, as Sergi also mentioned, we're soon to be called Yahoo uh, yet again. Um, I primarily work on uh, machine learning solutions, uh, and today I'll be talking about uh, nearest neighbor search. Um, specifically some practical issues to think about when using ANNs in search applications. Uh, because there's been a lot of uh, buzz around the nearest neighbors in recent years, we've seen a lot of libraries and platforms appear, um, but not too much talk about some of the more you know, practical problems that need to be solved. And I'll try to exemplify them using some, some real applications. Uh, so as, as you mentioned, at Verizon, I work on, uh, on the Vespa platform. And if you're not familiar with it, uh, Vespa is uh, the open source uh, platform for uh, low latency computations over large evolving data. Um, it's a platform we've been developing over many years, it has roots spanning back to you know, the search and awards of the late 1990s. Um, but we open sourced it a few years back. So while it may seem new to many people, it's been battle tested over many years. And today serves hundreds of thousands of queries per second uh, at any given time all over the world, uh, serving hundreds of applications, hundreds of millions of users each month, and so on. Um, there's a debate, I think, on Thursday, uh, which compares Vela uh, Vespa to Elasticsearch and Lucene, which will surely be great. So check that one out if you're interested in, in Vespa. Um, so Vespa is, is fairly feature rich for many types of applications um, and its features are all included and tightly integrated with each other, uh, each other uh, such as you know, advanced relevant scoring with tensors, machine learning models. Um, one of the really cool features of Vespa is the ability to you know, string together or pipeline various machine learning models from various platforms uh, together across you know, different phases to calculate relevant scores and so on for queries. But, but that's another talk. Um, for this talk, we'll be looking at, uh, at nearest neighbors. Um, so with nearest neighbors, uh, we need to start with uh, representations. Um, so pretty much anything can be you know, represented by a list of numbers uh, or more formally a point or a vector in high dimension space. You know, text, images, um, this is an image of my dog. Uh, I was not really sure what's going on. Uh, he doesn't like his nearest neighbors. Uh, they're mostly cats. Um, but uh, even you know things like based on time, such as sound or video, or even user interactions, that can be represented by you know such representations. So uh, I'm not really going to talk about how we generate these representations. Uh, representation learning is a talk of its own. Uh, but it's had great progress recently with deep learning. Um, there's, however, one thing I'd like to say, and that uh, we've seen great results uh, when using representations that are you know, trained or adapted specifically for, for the use case. Uh, but these representations don't necessarily work all that well when it's transferred out of the domain. Uh, so for instance, for text, we've really seen, we haven't seen great results when using things like, you know, universal sentence encoders in relation to, you know, more classical approaches such as BM25 for certain cases. So, but again, I'm digressing, that's, that's another talk. But anyway, uh, these representations that we generate in some way, they map objects into some high, high dimensional space. Um, this allows us to, you know, find or, or search for nearest neighbors, for instance, to some, some query points. Um, the nearest neighbors are measured by some, you know, distance functions such as, you know, geometric distance or, or Euclidean uh, distance. Um, we have cosine angles, which you know, work well for uh, sparse representations of particular texts. Uh, Manhattan distance, Hamming distance when working on bit vectors and so on. Um, to actually, you know, find the nearest neighbors, what we can do is just scan through all points in a kind of brute force uh, manner and determine the closest ones according to some some distance measure. Um, of course, you know, this brute force doesn't really scale that well, so we need some sort of index structure to help us, you know, navigate this this space. Um, Unfortunately, there aren't really any known methods of doing this exactly, so we need to resort to approximate solutions, uh, which hopefully gives us good enough results. Uh, there are a few different uh, methods for this, and I basically divide them into whether or not they can be uh, represented with traditional inverse indexes. Um, those that can, such as k-means or product quantization and its relatives, um, 
um, locality sensitive hashing basically create groups of centroids or buckets for similar items and you can kind of find the most similar bucket or centroid to the query and prune away a lot of the search space you know that way uh, the other group of methods is those that you know don't use these inverse indexes such as you know hierarchical navigable small worlds or hmsw which i'll get back to a little bit later but uh, basically this is a, a graph structure that we search through instead but you know, for most cases, this is a little bit you know too low level. Instead, we use libraries uh, to help us uh, do this. And a great resource for that is annbenchmarks.com. Um, this site compares various libraries across many different data sets that have different distant measures and vector lengths and so on. And uh, they're graphically compared in figures such as this, which compares recall to queries per second. So up and to the right is um, is is better, uh, you know, giving higher recall with with higher QPS. Um, just kind of short where the measurements here. You know, these these graphs are all single CPU, single thread. So so they measure the latency and don't really measure the potential for throughput or or maximizing the queries per second uh, using, for instance, multiple threads, which is just as or maybe even more important for many types of applications. So uh, when choosing a library, this is something I might want to think about, at least it's something we care a lot about at, uh, at, uh, at Vespa. Anyways, um, here I've shown just a few libraries to declutter a little bit. Uh, notable ones are scanned from, from Google, uh, Fives from Facebook, and the way from Spotify, and, and of course, Vespa. Um, so we have a, a pull request in to ANN, ANN benchmarks to include Vespa's ANN implementation, even though it's not really available as a standalone library. Uh, but we wanted to measure how good our implementation is against the others. And as you might see, it's not you know, right at the top, but it's competitive with others we compare uh, ourselves to, uh, which is, if, if you kind of are able to see that, our other uh, libraries that use this HNSW approach. Um, and the reason for that is that Vespa's implementation is, of course, based on the HNSW for a few good reasons. Um, one is, of course, you know, it performs well during retrieval, um, but perhaps more importantly is that it allows for incremental modification. Uh, now, most of the other approaches I mentioned, they build indexes offline, you know, in batches. Uh, so the index is kind of immutable and requires some or sometimes lengthy indexing periods, you know, particularly for, for large data sets. Uh, but a central design of, of Vespa is that data that's indexed should be, you know, immediately available for searching. Uh, and for many types of application, that's that's really important. And it's directly supported by the say NHSW algorithm. Um, now we've done some modifications to this algorithm, such as allowing removes as well, which is equally uh, important, uh, removing uh, stale data. So in the previous slide, we saw some libraries that do uh, vector similarity search. Um, there are also higher level platforms, such as you know, perhaps Milvus, we 8 Pinecone, and so on, that um, offers a vector search service that you can call out to from your serving stack. Um, which library or platform you ultimately choose, of course, depends on what type of system you're developing. I mean, background index building might be a perfectly acceptable solution for applications uh, where data doesn't really change that often. Uh, however, when it comes to you know search and and recommendation applications, um, there is an, another important aspect uh, which isn't touched upon uh, that often, and that is uh, filtering on metadata. So what I mean by that is that most often in a, in a search application, each item in the data usually has um, associated data with it or, or side information or, or metadata. Uh, now, this metadata is usually stored separately from the library or service implementing the nearest neighbor search. And um, this can become problematic, as we'll see shortly. So uh, the first example is a semantic search uh, for text. Now, again, Assume you have some way of encoding text such that you know documents or, or paragraphs or sentences, you can encode them to, to vectors. Uh, one common way these days is to use transformer models such as BERT and so on to uh, and use one of the token vector representations there as an embedding vector. Um, any way you do this, you can you know visualize these points uh, in some high high dimensional space. Um, now assume also that you have some way of encoding a query so that it maps into the same space so that the closest documents uh, in this space is the most relevant to the query. 
Uh, now, queries usually have some different properties than documents. Um, for one, they're typically much shorter. Um, so they typically don't use the same encoding model, um, but to ensure that they kind of map into the same space, we can use like a, a two tower configuration, which includes a distance function uh, and propagate the tuning process. But uh, anyway, uh, mapping the query into the same space, we can find well here, for instance, the 10 most uh, relevant documents to, to the query. And, and this works well. However, um, search applications might allow the user to kind of drill into the results by, for instance, here, uh, filtering uh, on the publication year of the document. Now, since we've first retrieved the top 10, 10 documents using uh, nearest neighbor search, uh, and then we filter for the year 2021, we only actually here retrieve the th three relevant documents to the query. I mean, the other documents, the one in orange here, uh, that are in this space are not recall at all, even though they are uh, relevant to the user. Now, this is kind of a, a, a constructed example, but you know, clearly shows the problem we're we need to solve. So again, to repeat that, I mean, the nearest neighbor search returns the 10 closest items to the query and applying the filter uh, 2021, seven out of those 10 results are, are filtered away, leaving only the three that actually pass the filter, which is the ultimate result of this search. Um, so naively, you know, to return the top 10 documents that actually do pass the filter, uh, we need to search in this case for, you know, something around 50 results instead of 10. Uh, problem is we don't really know how much to search for beforehand. So, but we'll see later how we can improve upon this. Um, so, uh, another example: uh, recommendation. So, uh, recommendation is, is similar to search, uh, but the query is the actual uh, user profile. Uh, we want to search for items to to recommend, given what we know uh, about a user. Uh, so, classically, we'd use approaches such as matrix factorization. Uh, these days, of course, use more deep learning approaches such as neural collaborative filtering and, and its descendants. Um, these figures here, by the way, they're from a, a news recommendation tutorial we have uh, for Vespa in case you're interested. Um, in any case, uh, we create these user embeddings and item embeddings and find the items to recommend by doing a dot product or, or inner product search between the user embeddings and the, the item embeddings. Uh, this is called maximum inner product search, uh, and it isn't really you know, directly implementable in uh, approximate nearest neighbor algorithms. So we need to convert the MIPS problem to, for instance, a Euclidean distance problem, which, which allows us to do so. Um, now for recommendation services such as YouTube and TikTok and so on, uh, there are a lot of you know, inherent filters we need to consider, such as you know, uh, age appropriateness, band content, uh, region availability, language, and so on. Uh, and there might be more you know, dynamic filters, such as the business rules for uh, diversity and deduplication and, and so on. Um, but all these kind of serve to potentially you know, filter away a lot of otherwise relevant items. So that the effect is that we recall far a fewer items than what we otherwise could have. Um, ad search, another example, uh, similar application really. Um, the image here to the, to the right here is taken from the front page of yahoo.com, uh, which to a large degree runs on Vespa. Uh, and you have this kind of infinite scrolling uh, stream a uh, new stream, which has these kind of native ads kind of hidden in the stream. Um, likewise, users have uh, profiles, as, as do ads, and the dot product between these two you know, correspond to the kind of interestingness of the ad to the user, at least hopefully. Um, now, these, these ads also have a lot of metadata, such as you know, target group, uh, target location, geographic location, and so on and so on. Uh, but one very important piece of data is the ads or, or ad campaigns budget. Uh, so the advertiser might pay for each impression, and we don't earn any money if we show an ad that has spent a budget. So, so likewise, if we first do a vector search and then perform filters afterwards, there's a real possibility that we aren't really you know, retrieving the most interesting or most profitable ads uh, to show uh, to the user. Uh, so. Uh, in online dating, uh, you have your uh, your profile of, of interests. Um, now, that's what you are interested in. It could be like pets and travel and food and TV shows, working out, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is your, your representation. 
Um, when searching for uh, potential matches, you also have a set of preferences or, or filters, such as you know geographical location. Uh, you might want to meet people close to you, a gender, age range. Are they at least six feet tall? Um, and other filters, uh, particularly for services such as Tinder, where you uh, filter away users where you already swipe them uh, left or right. Uh, so again, if, if first retrieving profiles using uh, nearest neighbors, there's a big chance that the people that you know best match your interests don't pass all of these filters. Uh, so many potential matches are, are, are not retrieved and no date for you. Um, shopping, another obvious example, really. Uh, this example here is from a use case in our documentation for using um, a Vespa in shopping. Um, the use case sample up here even comes with a front end, as can be seen here. Um, now, products can have their representations and queries can be mapped to the same vector space as the products. And products have a lot of metadata, of course, the price, category, brands, even rating. Uh, probably one of the important ones is whether or not the item is in stock. Um, getting results for items that can't be purchased because they're out of stock might be a, a poor user experience. Uh, and again, by, by first retrieving products using nearest neighbors and then filtering using uh, metadata would likely lead to a lot of relevant products not, not being retrieved. Uh, finally, um, local business search. Um, let's say I want to search for restaurants near me. Uh, and we've implemented some sort of personalized search so that my preference profile is used to retrieve the restaurants that best fit my profile. Now, uh, assume that my profile uh, retrieves only the best restaurants in the world. Uh, of course, it's, it's unlikely that they're close to me, at least for the, the small town that I live up north, which is the red dot up, up uh, top there. Um, well, that's not actually not uh, true. We do have some great restaurants here. We do have a few Michelin stars uh, here. Uh, but anyway, uh, restaurants that best fit my profile uh, globally are, are pretty unlikely to be close to me, meaning that you would very likely not return any results at all. So uh, this, is, this is kind of an extreme example. Obviously, you wouldn't do this, but, uh, but the point stands. <clears throat> So uh, the point being uh, is that you know post filtering uh, of uh, metadata doesn't really work all that well. So what can you do about that? Um, one obvious uh, approach is to um, uh, recall more, uh, just return more items from the nearest neighbor search. Um, however, that can become quite expensive, you know, both in processing and, and time, especially if these need to kind of cross the network. Uh, and still, this isn't really you know guaranteed to work. Uh, another option is to you know, set up multiple indexes uh, with one per filter. Uh, for instance, in a text search example, one index per publication year. Um, now, this might work if you have a small number of filters and can avoid the explosion of combinations, but, but still, this, this adds a lot of complexity. Um, now, the solution really is to do a nearest neighbor search only among the items that have survived filtering. That is pre-filtering, and the approaches that I mentioned previously, you know, the libraries and platforms, they don't really support this, as the nearest neighbor index and metadata usually are, you know, in separate systems. However, uh, in Vespa, we've modified the basic uh, HNSW to to support this uh, by introducing eligibility lists. Um, this causes the algorithm to effectively skip items that are not in this list. So in this figure, uh, again, the orange are the items that pass the filter, the blue are items that we want to skip. Uh, so the algorithm effectively you know, dynamically increases the search area according to the number of items that we want to retrieve and the items in the eligibility list. Um, and this is nice because we only return the exact number of results that we want to, thus solving you know, the problem of, of post-filtering. Um, there's perhaps one thing that should be mentioned, and that there's a, a still a slight cost to navigate the graph uh, for items that are skipped. So if the filter is strong, uh, meaning there are relatively few items in, in this eligibility list, the cost of searching the graph uh, can be high. And then to solve this problem, uh, Vespa falls back to exact nearest neighbor scan, uh, only through the list of eligible items when this happens, because that is actually more efficient than, than navigating the graph. So, uh, and this threshold is, of course, configurable, and that's one of the kind of nice things that, uh, that this adds to, to the table. So uh, to kind of uh, sum up, um, Vespa innovates a little bit with approximate nearest neighbors uh, search to fit in with you know, many of the different aspects that are important in search applications. 
Um, one is the dynamic modification of the graph by you know, particularly supporting uh, removing of items. Um, use efficient data structures and methods to increase the performance uh, when building uh, indexes. Uh, and it modifies HNSW uh, to, to support uh, pre-filtering. Um, now, the implementation we chose uh, to support ANNs are really a consequence of fitting in with the design philosophy of Vespa. And it's important to note that Vespa is much more than a vector search engine. And all the examples that we saw previously are actual applications using, uh, using uh, Vespa. So some other use cases here, you know, text search using both classic information retrieval techniques such as BM25 uh, and more modern approaches such as vector similarity and transformers such as BERT, et cetera. Um, recommendation and personalization using, again, vector search and machine learning models, uh, true partial updates, and so on. Um, another example which we have a pretty good sample app for is question answering, which uses uh, ANNs to select passages with answers to questions and uses BERT models to extract the exact answer to the question. And, and we have many more examples. But uh, even finding love. Um, OkCupid, the inspiration for the online dating example, has a great blog post on why they chose uh, Vespa over uh, Elasticsearch. Um, so that pretty much sums up uh, my talk. Uh, if you want to know more about Vespa, check out these, these resources. Uh, we have an open source version and a cloud offering as well, um, which currently has a, a free trial if you want to check it out. Um, other than that, uh, tune into the, the search engine debate um, on Thursday to, to learn more. Uh, so with that, thanks. And I'm going to qu open the questions. Thank you for the great talk. And uh, what is the way to finish it up with uh, finding the love also with Vespa, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. So we got a few questions from the audience. Um, so first question would be, how customizable is Vespa? Can we develop and plug custom relevance algorithm? I think you mentioned a bit of like custom models, right? But how actually complicated is that to you know develop a new similarity model or like new algorithm, right? And so yeah. uh, it's very customizable. So uh, basically, uh, Vespa is, is divided a little bit in two. Uh, we call it the kind of stateless uh, front end, and we have a kind of a stateful back end, which uh, where you have all the content and all the kind of that's where all the computation is done. So on the back end, uh, you can write your custom uh, ranking functions uh, to do pretty much whatever computation you want to do using tensors and combining them with the machine learning models and so on. Um, in the front in the stateless layer, you can add your custom Java code, which pretty much can do any form of processing, both when um, uh, handling queries or ingesting data and so on. So I would say Vespa is, is, is very customizable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice, very good. And uh, kind of like a similar question, but from other direction. Um, does Vespa also support traditional relevance algorithm, for example, BM25, TFIDFs? If yes, how does it work, right? Can you combine them, right? Or you need to decide like it's either one or another one? No, as, as I as I mentioned in just a few slides ago, um, BM25, or at least you know these traditional information retrieval techniques, uh, they're very well supported. That's the kind of basis, really, of of, of Vespa. Um, and uh, they're supported both in forms of matching and uh, you know the first phase you know searching for all documents and using them in ranking as well so so vespa is very flexible in how you actually match these documents or or rank upon them as well so yeah the these are definitely uh, supported but one of the nice things is that, is that uh, you can kind of combine these more traditional information retrieval approaches with more modern information retrievals as well uh, and and uh, adding machine learned models to like a later phase Model uh, or um, later phase expression or uh, calculation as well. So uh, yes, Vespa is very flexible in in that regard. So essentially, you can get like you know uh, top whatever end right from a neighborhood right, and after sort by whatever your like TFADF that you were actually aiming for right. As example, right? Yeah, exactly. True. Okay, should be possible. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, and uh, what else I have here with questions? So there's like more questions popping up, that's why like, <laughs> okay, so first question or like third one actually, um, what is the core features of Lucene that are not supported by Vespa? Yeah. I guess like people would be like, hey, this is like so amazing. So why do I still need to have Lucene? Uh, 
to be blatantly honest, uh, I uh, don't work too much with uh, Lucene in that. I'm, I'm a fan of Vespa, so, so that's my focus. And to, to get a good answer to that question, uh, I'd uh, refer to the great debate on Thursday, uh, which will have uh, experts both on Vespa and uh, Lucene and on Elasticsearch to answer a lot of those different questions there. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Some yeah. people are also asking about performance is comparison. I know, right? But I think the benchmarks that you mentioned would be like really the ultimate answer for those, right? So just like go to the website and people can find it, right? Uh, definitely. So uh, so again, um, we've added a pull request to add the, the performance of the ANN uh, implementation of SPA2, ANN benchmarks. Uh, but uh, we don't really you know, uh, provide uh, the NN um, code in Vespa as a library, as a standalone library. It's part mm -hmm. of you know, the, the, the bigger system. Um, still, we want to see how, how well it performs. Uh, but uh, it's, it's um, important to note that it's, it's working in the context of a larger you know, search system, which does a lot of other stuff uh, as mm -hmm. well. So, so um, uh, that needs to be taken into consideration too. Yeah, sounds good. Um, another question actually from my side. So you mentioned this uh, example with a budget, right? And uh, me coming from e-commerce, I kind of like seen it like uh, across the board, right? So do you see, because I mean, the easy solution would be saying like, hey, if budget is like out, right? You just like stop showing the things, right? But it also means that with a website, like as a Yahoo, for instance, right? You can have like, you know, like lots of impressions, right? And after suddenly they go like to zero. Is there like any ways that you can see that it's like still scalable and you can do it more dynamically, right? So you can, you know, like a boost visibility, a bit of like less, right? And kind of like a do of uh, uh, controlling algorithm, like in a way, right? When there's like a lot of budget, right? You have visibility. If not, like it's kind of like becoming like less and less, but not drastically, right? From one to zero. Yeah, so uh, I guess there's different ways of of, uh, of handling that. Um, you can kind of bake that into your kind of ranking function in a way, and that you mm -hmm. have a, a sort of kind of a graded uh, decrease, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. You don't want to you know suddenly come into the position where you 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 only have uh, ads to show, which all of them have used uh, used up their budgets and so on. Of course, so um, we have uh, different teams um, that that work on this specifically, and those are just one of the kind of many applications that are in Vespa. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I really don't have full view into how they handle exactly this, this question, yeah. but they definitely have to uh, solve that. Sounds good. Thank you.